<clears throat> All right, chapter eight. This is the first part of your lecture. Um, I will let you know when your test is going to be as soon as we figure out when the dissection is going to be. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about the introduction of invertebrates and their characteristics, um, the classes of our types of fishes, and then we're going to start talking about the biology of fishes. So first, around 570 million years ago, the first invertebrates um, appeared, and they were probably uh, an ancient ancestor of the fish, very fish-like. Uh, and vertebrates are really, really important because they have an absolutely tremendous impact on the marine environment. They are used for food, they are used for fertilizer, they make products um, such as leather, glue, vitamins, they're fished for sport, and they're also for pets. So here we have our chordate ancestor, and here we have our first appearance of vertebrate animals with our jawless fishes. Here we have our tetrapod ancestor, which eventually becomes probably some kind of lobe fin fish, like a lung fish or something, where it branches off to be car our cartilaginous fishes, our ray finned fishes, and then our other types of vertebrates. Okay. So phylum chordata is similar to other chordates, subphylum vertebrata, um, except that they have a backbone. So they do exhibit those four other um, <clears throat> those four characteristics that all chordates share at some point in their life cycle. As you see in this picture down here, this is our model vertebrate. So vertebrates, uh, model chordate, I'm sorry, and vertebrates have that dorsal hollow nerve cord, the pharyngeal slits, the notochord, and the post-anal tail, okay? Again, how they're different is they have a vertebral column or a spine, um, and it's basically composed of a dorsal row of hollow bones. Each individual bone is called a vertebrae. And the function of the vertebral column or the spine is to enclose and protect the nerve cord or the spinal cord. So if you look at this picture down here, here's our dorsal hollow nerve cord. That is the most dorsal structure. Just underneath that is the notochord. The notochord eventually evolves and becomes or develops into the vertebral column, wrapping itself around that dorsal hollow nerve cord. Um, also in vertebrates, the spinal cord ends in the brain, and, which is in the anterior portion, and that brain becomes protected by a skull. Vertebrates have bilateral symmetry, and they also have an endoskeleton. So fishes are some of our oldest and structurally simplest of living vertebrates. Um, they are the most abundant of all the vertebrates. Okay, so there's around 30,000 species and half, 30,000 species of fish. They make up, again, about half of all the vertebrates, and about 15,000 species of fishes are marine. So about half of those 30,000 species are marine. And there's three different groups that marine fishes fall into. They can fall into the jawless fishes, the cartilaginous fishes, or the bony fishes. So we're going to start first with our jawless fishes. And jawless fishes belong to class Agnatha. It's the most primitive of all the classes of fishes that are living today. And some of the characteristics of jawless fishes, they lack jaws, Okay, so they feed by suction with a round muscular mouth and rows of teeth. I'll show you a picture of this. They also lack paired fins. They lack scales, and they lack vertebrae. Okay, but they do have long cylindrical bodies. They're very eel-like, and there's two types of jawless fishes alive today, hagfishes and lampreys. So this top picture here, that you see this top animated picture, this is our hagfish, and hagfish are also called... Slime eels. So if you look down here, this picture right here is an, um, a, an example of a hagfish. And what this guy here is pulling out of this bin, you can see the tails of the hagfish coming out. This is a slime that they produce, very, very thick, viscous slime that they produce and can be harvested uh, for production in certain products. So just underneath this picture is our lamprey. And our lamprey are different than the hagfish based on the mouth parts. So you can see there's tentacles in the hagfish and the lamprey has these rows of teeth like this. You can see in this picture here, all those rows of teeth. And they can also be differentiated based on the number of gill slits. So hagfish have 12 pairs of gill slits, whereas lampreys have seven pairs of gill slits. Okay, they also feed a lot differently. Uh, hagfish will um, feed mostly on dead or dying fishes. They'll burrow on muddy bottoms of moderate depth in cold waters. Something will die, it will sink. The hagfish will then begin to eat that dying or already dead uh, animal. The lamprey here is uh, mostly freshwater species. Hagfish are mostly marine, lampreys are mostly freshwater. Uh, sometimes the species 
and certain species of lampreys, the adults can move to sea, but they feed by attaching to other fishes and sucking their blood. So right here you can see this fish was pulled out of the water and there are two lamprey attached to this fish feeding on the blood of that vertebrate. They also, some species can feed on bottom in, uh, invertebrates. So let's move on and talk about class chondrichthys or our cartilaginous fishes. And this class is composed of sharks, skates, and rays, and rat fishes. And this is an ancient group of fishes, and they have a skeleton, as their name implies, composed of cartilage. Uh, they also have um, movable jaws with well-developed teeth. They have paired lateral fins that make them very efficient swimmers, and they have a type of scale called placoid scales, which give them a rough sandpaper-like skin. Okay, so the placoid scales have the same structure. It's composed of the same structure as the teeth, and it also helps reduce drag as these fishes swim. So their mouth is ventral, so their movable jaws have very well-developed teeth with a ventral mouth, which means the mouth is more positioned, not at the very end of the anterior side, but on the underside. So their nose protrudes past their mouth, their mouth is on the ventral side. So this isn't a microscopic picture of what their placoid scales look like. So you can see why they would give them a, a sandpaper-like rough texture. So let's move on and talk about sharks, our first group of cartilaginous fishes. There's around 350 species of sharks and they are very well developed for fast swimming and predatory feeding. Um, some sharks actually haven't changed at all. They haven't evolved much for the past 100 million years. Okay, so their body, what makes them such efficient predators is part of their body shape. So they have fusiform bodies or torpedo-shaped bodies that are rounded in the middle and tapered at the ends. And this shape enables sharks to slip very easily through the water. Their tail, uh, or their caudal fin, they have a very well-developed caudal fin, and it is what we call heterocircle. So if you look at their caudal fin here, this picture of the caudal fin, you can see that the upper lobe is much more pronounced. It's much um, longer than the lower lobe down here. Okay. They have two dorsal fins. They have large pointed paired pectoral fins. Sharks also have five to seven gill slits behind the head on each side. And some examples here, this is our next slide, five to seven gill slits behind the head. And they have rows of teeth. So what happens is when uh, a tooth in the very front is lost or damaged or broken, the tooth behind it then will slowly move up and replace us. And this happens throughout the entire uh, shark's life. So most sharks do exhibit this body plan. Some of the exceptions to this body plan are hammerhead, saw sharks, and thresher sharks. So here's those three examples. So here's the hammerhead shark up here. And hammerhead sharks have a wide, flattened head that acts as a rudder, and it also widens their sensory organs for better reception. Okay, so they're extremely intelligent animals. Um, they have extremely well-developed sensory organs in that head region. Saw sharks is this one down here in the bottom picture. As their name implies, they have that long, flattened um, head that's armed with those teeth okay, that look like a saw. And then our last uh, exception to this um, body form of sharks, the general body form, is a thresher shark. And a thresher shark has a very long upper lobe on their tail. So here's that long upper lobe. And they use that to herd and stun fish that they're preying on. So shark size varies. They can be very, very tiny, 10 inches in the spined pygmy shark, all the way up to about 60 feet, uh, which the largest fish in the ocean is a whale shark. Um, so whale sharks have been known to get about 60 feet, but it is rare to see them above 40 feet. Okay, our basking shark is our next largest shark that can be full grown up to about 50 feet, but it's commonly seen at less than 33 feet. And then our third largest fish in the sea is our white shark, white, great white shark that can get up to about 20 feet. And fish, sharks, live in all parts of the ocean. Uh, they're much more prevalent in tropical coastal waters because there's a lot of diversity, uh, prey diversity in tropical coastal waters. Uh, whale sharks and basking sharks are filter feeders that feed on plankton and they will follow plankton blooms around warm water. So here's the pictures of our sharks. Our, our pygmy shark is up here. 
uh, in the hand of this gentleman. Next to our pygmy shark is our basking shark. You can, you can see the very big mouth of the basking shark opening to filter out that plankton. Down here we have our whale shark, and next to our whale shark we have our great white. So before we move on in this lecture, I want you to take a second and Google this. Okay, I want you to Google and come up with some different ways of how you can tell the difference between skates and rays, and I also want you to Google how animals produce electricity. So we are going to talk about how skates, the differences between skates and rays, but we're not really going to talk about how animals produce electricity yet, but I am going to check this in your notes, so please make sure you Google these two questions. All right, so rays and skates are next group of cartilaginous fishes, um, and rays and skates are different than sharks because their dorsal ventrally flattened. So again, their dorsal surface and their ventral surface are pushed together, creating this pancake-like shape that you see in these pictures. So there's around 450 to 500 spe 550 species of um, rays and skates. They are demersal organisms, meaning they live on the bottom. Uh, they're distinguishable from sharks not only by their body form, but also they have five pairs of gill slits on the underside of their body. So sharks have five to seven gill slits, pairs of gill slits just behind the head. Rays and skates have exactly five pairs of gill slits on the ventral side of their body. They have modified pectoral fins that are flat and expanded. They look like wings, and they have eyes that are typically on top of their head. So sawfishes look like saw sharks that have ventral gill slits. So here we see this is a sawfish, um, and they feed by swinging their blades through schools of fish, and it can, they can be up to about 36 feet long. So that's what you're seeing in this uh, picture down here. Okay. So stingrays have a whip-like tail with stinging spines at the base for defense, as you see in some of these pictures. Um, they have poison glands that produce venom, and uh, oftentimes abdominal wounds, which occur when handling rays, may result in death. So it's not a smart thing, especially some of our bigger stingrays, to try to catch them in a net because they can be deadly. And rays, stingrays, feed on clams, crabs, small fishes, and other small animals that are on the seafloor. So here we have an electric ray. And electric rays have special organs around their head that can produce around 200 volts of electricity. And what this is for is using to stun their prey and also to discourage predators from harming them. This video here, you, you won't be able to hear the audio in these lectures, but I am going to post these videos within the lecture on Blackboard. And here we have our manta rays and our spotted eagle rays. So here we have a manta ray over here and our spotted re eagle ray on the left. And our manta rays, um, which are oftentimes manta rays and devil rays, uh, they're called, look like they fly, and eagle rays as well, look like they fly through the water uh, using their pectoral fins like wings. And skates look like rays, but they lack a whip-like tail and stinging spines. So uh, spotted eagle rays and manta rays tend to be, l uh, you know, less of a demersal organism, more of an open water species of ray. Okay. So skates, again, they, they lack that whip-like tail and stinging spines. Another difference between skates and rays is that skates lay eggs, whereas rays give birth to live young. And our third group of cartilaginous fishes are our ratfishes, also called chimeras. And there's around 30 species of ratfishes or chimeras. There are mostly deep water species, and they're distinguishable because they have one pair of gill slits that's covered by a flap of skin. Okay, and the gill slits being covered by a flap of skin is um, seen in bony fishes, not other cartilaginous fish fishes. They're called ratfishes because they have a long rat-like tail, and they feed on bottom-dwelling crustaceans and other mollusks. And here's a picture of our ratfish. Actually kind of cute. All right, our next class of fishes are our bony fishes that belong to class Osteichthys. And there's around, this. obviously as their uh, name suggests, bony fishes have a skeleton that's made partially of bone with some cartilage. There's about 23,000 species of bony fishes, which makes up 96% of all fishes. Uh, one of their differences besides the skeleton in bony fishes from cartilaginous fishes is their type of scales. So bony fishes have um, cycloid or tenoid scales, and these scales are made of bone and covered by a thin layer of skin and protective mucus. 
So here you can see the difference in our scales. So we have our cycloid scales that have a smooth edge on the backside, and our tenoid scales have teeth-like projections along the backside. So they're spiny scales. So bony fishes, another difference between bony fishes and cartilaginous fishes is the presence of an operculum, which is a gill cover. And again, it's a bony flap that protects the gills, okay? And they do have control of the operculum, so they can actually open it uh, and close it. And we'll talk about that when we get to respiration. Bony fishes have a homocircle tail, which is, again, different than cartilaginous fishes with a heterocircle tail. So if you dissect that word, homo means the same. So their homocircle caudal fin means that the upper lobe and the lower lobe are the same in size. They, they have fins that are covered by a thin membrane and supported by bony spines, or what we call fin rays. And this makes the, their, these fish, bony fishes, highly maneuverable. They have a terminal mouth with protrusible jaws. So again, terminal mouth. Cartilaginous fishes have a ventral mouth. Bony fishes have a terminal mouth. So the very anterior end of their body is their mouth. And the protrusible jaws means that their jaws are able to protrude out and become very wide. And they also have teeth attached to jaw bones. And they have the swim bladder. So cartilaginous fish sharks, for example, the way they keep themselves buoyant is A, they have a cartilage skeleton. Okay, so not only is cartilage lighter than bone, so it keeps them more buoyant. It's also more flexible than bone. Um, and because bone can be heavy, bony fishes require a gas-filled sac called a swim bladder that allows them to adjust their buoyancy. Okay, the way that the fusiform body of a shark also keeps the shark floating, the way that its uh, nose is pointed up and the way that its fins help keep that body oriented towards the surface. Okay. So here's just some... Uh, of the fins of a bony fish. So we have our caudal fin that helps move the fish, propelling the fish forward. We have our anal fins here that have about 10 to 13 bony fin rays and keep, helps keep the fish upright. We have our dorsal fin that has eight to 10 fin rays and stops the fish from rolling over, so from rolling over on its side. Our pelvic fins here down at the bottom work together to move the fish up and down. And here are tiny little pectoral fins up here that are not labeled. Um, allow that fish to swim forward and backwards and left and right. So this is just an example of the protrusible jaws. So you can see here in this animated picture, frames one through six, how those jaws are actually protruded out with the muscular and bony structures. Here's what they look like extended. And you can see that again, compared to like the size of this fish, its mouth opens pretty wide and what seems to be kind of far away from their body. Okay, so again, our um, videos, the YouTube videos won't work. You won't be able to hear the audio, but I will post them in Blackboard within the lecture. So let's move on a little bit and talk about some of the biology of marine fishes. So there's a whole study, scientific study of fishes that we call ichthyology. And one of the aspects of ichthyology is to figure out how fishes adapt to their environments because fishes have been around a really long time. Some of the first vertebrates to... Uh, have evolved, and sometimes we can learn things about animals that evolved so early on. How have they been able to adapt to their environment and live as, as long as they have and branch off to be so many species? Let's start with body shape, and body shape of fishes is directly related to lifestyle. Okay, so what we mean by that is how that fish lives. If it's demersal, like the rays and skates that we talked about here, like a flounder over here, then its body shape, which is flat, to camouflage itself, to, to um, look like it fits in with the, the flat bottom, its body shape is obviously directly related to its lifestyle. Um, here we have an eel fish, and this eel's body shape that's long and snake-like. Eels live within the cracks and crevices, sometimes much smaller than themselves, uh, but on reefs and its body allows it to do that. Then we have a fusiform body, like up here, this tuna, that's very streamlined, and it's usually seen in strong, fast swimmers like tunas and sharks, mackerels, and marlins. So a lot of times down here we have 
some fish that have a more compressed body form and it's thin, it's easy for swimming, it's quick, short bursts of speed, butterfly fishes, gunnels, and wrasses. So here, this gunnel right here has a very compressed body form. Um, and then we have some organisms, again, that are flat, demersal lifestyle that fly through the water, and the, that's what we call a depressed body form. So our fusiform body, our compressed body, and our depressed body are our three most common body shapes seen in bony fishes. And again, the fusiform body is streamlined, strong, fast swimmers like tunas, sharks, mackerels, and marlins. We have compressed body forms that most fish that we see have a compressed body form. It's thin. They're easy swimmers. They have, they're very quick, short bursts of speed. And then we have depressed body forms, which are flat for a demersal lifestyle, seemingly like they fly through the water. And then we have other fish that have very irregular shapes, like the seahorse, for example, has a very irregular shape. And what this does is act as camouflage so that fish, some fish with um, irregular shapes can live and hide among seagrass or seaweed or rocks. So a really good example of an irregular body shape would be right here, this uh, rockfish or stonefish that's very highly poisonous. But as you can see, this is an actual fish. You see its little eye right here and you see its mouth here, but it looks like a rock. So let's move on and talk a little bit about coloration. So coloration in fishes is due to these two specialized cells that we call chromatophores. And chromatophores have an irregular shape and they um, contract and expand pigment in order to produce the color. So this is what a chromatophore cell would look like. And you can see the pigment granules in uh, the center and you can see it is uh, irregularly shaped compared to other cells and it has these um, arms or these canals that radiate off of it that are muscular. And what happens is that this, the muscles in the cell will contract and concentrating the pigment in the center or spreading it out. And when the pigment is concentrated in the center, it produces a very bright or dark, um, more noticeable color. When that pigment is expanding throughout the cell, then it's a less bright, less noticeable color. So some of our coloration patterns, there's quite a few different coloration patterns that we see. Most of them are structural colors. And structural colors um, are the result when, special, when a special surface reflects only certain colors of lights. So this would be a consequence of other specialized cells that we call iridophores. So these fish look shiny or iridescent, as you see right here. This is a shiny or iridescent fish. And here, this is the iridophores up close. Some of our other color patterns of fish, um, we have cryptic coloration, which is when fish ha are colored or they use color to blend in with their environment for cam camouflage. Um, sometimes there's some fish that are very brightly colored, particularly in tropical reef areas, and these fishes are the ones that use the chromatophores, those cells with the pigments, and sometimes they can even change their, their color depending on things like mood, reproductive condition. Um, sometimes colors can tell us if fish are dangerous or poisonous and taste bad, and we would call this warning coloration. And for camouflage purposes, again, our fish would have the cryptic coloration, which we talked about, disruptive coloration, which is when there's stripes, fish are striped to break up an outline that confuses predators, especially when the fish is in a group, um, because it's more difficult for that predator to single out just one. They can't tell where one fish ends and another fish begins. And then there is also a camouflaging coloration pattern known as countershading. And countershading is seen very often in open water fishes. And what this is, is the fish have very light bellies, so a ventral side that's light, and then their dorsal side or their backside that's very dark. Okay, and again, we've talked a little bit about this, but when we're talking about a fish that's trying either A, to camouflage itself from its prey while it's hunting, or fish that are trying to camouflage itself from its predator, if you look up, that you see the light underside of the belly, it's masking the, or mimicking, I should say, the lightness of the surface of the ocean. If you're on top of that fish, that's either your prey or your predator, and you're looking down, you're seeing the dark side of its back and that mimics the darkness of the deep ocean and or the ocean floor. Okay, so we're gonna stop here. This is part one of your lecture for chapter eight. Um, so again, you are responsible for these notes. So please make sure that you take them. You can hit pause. Uh, if we've gone too fast, I apologize for that. I will try to slow down in the future. Uh, this is just really quickly to show you some of our, our patterns of coloration. So here we have our lionfish there that's advertising the fact that it's poisonous. 
Here we have flounder that is camouflaged in with the bottom. Here, this fish here, uh, we have is the counter shading. You can see the dark top, light belly. And here we have our zebra fish that is, has the disruptive coloration. Again, that's helping confuse its predators. So kind of like zebras that stand in a pack, lions from afar can't tell where one zebra ends and one zebra begins because of that coloration pattern in the stripes. Okay, so we're finished. Until next time.